Right, okay, and so you're quite well known as one of, if not the premier's uh, so-called new historians in Israeli historiography. So maybe can you just describe to us exactly what that means and, okay. and why there was a new as opposed to an old? Okay, in the 1980s, a, a number of scholars began to look at new a archival a documentation which was being opened mainly in Israel but also in America and England and on the basis of this documentation we began to write a revised history of Israel or at least of the 1948 war and later so I wrote a book on the refugee problem and others wrote about Israeli Jordanian relations in 1948 and we became known as the new historians and this our product was called the new historiography Right, and, that, and if I understand correctly, so there, there was a significant difference in the narrative that came out of your work relative to the narrative that had, that had dominated historiography prior to the work of your generation. So specifically with respect to, maybe we can start with specifically with respect to the story of, um, as your first book focused on, the Palestinian refugee uh, situation and basically what caused it. Okay. Um, the, the new histor historians working in the 1980s and publishing books towards the end of the 1980s, a, focused on the 1948 war, which is the crucial, the first crucial Israeli-Arab war. Um, and the previous generation of historians writing in the 50s, 60s, and 70s had basically given the official Zionist government line. And ours, based on documentation, was a, more critical, if you like, of the Israeli side, also of the Arab side, but mainly of the Israeli traditional narrative. My book had focused on the Palestinian refugee problem, it was called The Birth of the Palestinian Refugee Problem, 1947-49, which came out in 1988. And um, it, basically, it countered the traditional Zionist, but also the traditional Arab narrative of why about 700,000 Palestinians had been uprooted from their homes in 1948. The traditional Zionist explanation was the Arab leaders had asked them or told them to leave, or they left for no good reason. Uh, the documentation which became available in the 80s showed that they left basically under Israeli military pressure. Some were expelled, some were actually ordered by their own people to leave, but essentially they left as a result of the war itself and the pressure of uh, war Israeli and Zionist war making um, and defeat. Right, so and since that time, again if I'm characterizing it correctly, there's been considerable uh, debate over how best to describe um, precisely what the policies or lack of policies were at the time that led to that eventual flight or expulsion, depending on the vocabulary you choose to describe it. So um, so, some within uh, the, the, the group of scholars who would identify as new historians go so far as to call it an ethnic cleansing. Um, others have, there, there's been sort of a revisionist push against the new, the new historian narrative saying that, no, no, generally, I'm thinking of, um, of individuals like Ephraim Karsh and others who have said, no, the Arab leaders essentially did call on the pal Palestinians to flee in the, in the hopes that the advancing Arab armies would push the Jews into the sea, which was sort of the standard Zionist line. What, how, do we, how, how do you as an historian approach what really happened and, and how much um, intentionality there was at various stages in the process? What are the tools you use and how have you come to the conclusions you've come to? Well, the, the tools uh, the tools an historian is supposed to use, and I used, is documentation. We look at documents, American, British, Israeli, United Nations. If there are some Arab documents available, and they're usually not available because Arab archives are all closed, we don't know what's there, uh, nobody knows what's there. Uh, but we, essentially, the documentation is the basis of the narrative which we produce, or uh, the history we produce. And um, my reading of the documents, and I read millions of documents, literally, um, it showed that there was no Israeli master plan of expulsion as the Arabs uh, in 48 and after 48 began to charge and have charged since. There was no master plan of expulsion. What happened was the result... Sorry, just one second. The dog's moving the drive by. Oh, God. <laughs> so the question was, uh, the, the tools that you use... And... Okay, I remember, yeah. yeah. Um, look, historians are supposed to base their historiography on documentation. And luckily, in the 1980s, Israel began to open, in line with the 30-year archival rule, it began to open its documentation, as did the Americans and the British, who also have similar uh, declassification uh, timetables. So these are state archives? These are state archives, but also private archives, kibbutz archives, municipal archives. They all began to really open their, their stuff in the 1980s.
Um, and um, on the basis of this documentation, I arrived at the conclusion that there was no Israeli master plan, as the Arabs contended at the time and later, to expel the Arabs of Palestine. There was no such plan. There was no such policy. The cabinet did not decide, the Israeli cabinet did not decide to expel the Arabs. The Israeli general staff did not decide to expel the Arabs. There were no such decisions. But there was a general willingness to see the backs of the Arabs, because these were the Arabs who were waging war against the Jewish state, the establishment of the state, and later the state itself once it had been established. So it's logical that the leaders didn't want many Arabs at the back of the armies then confronting the Arab states. The Arab states' armies had invaded Palestine in May 1948. The, popu the Arab population behind the lines, the Palestinians were regarded as a fifth column or threat. And it was fairly natural to, see, to want to see them leave. Um, and so I would say probably in many echelons of command in the Haganah and the Israeli army, the uh, Zionist militia and then the Israeli army which emerged from it, uh, there was a desire to see the backs of the Arabs, to see them leave. Uh, in some places there were expulsions, in other places there were no expulsions, which is why Israel has a large Arab minority population to this day. There was no consistent policy. On, on the part of the Arab states, there was no policy to get the Arabs to leave, but here and there there were Arab armies who, who um, expelled Arab population or instructed them to leave various places. Arab leaders in Haifa, for example, told the Arab population in Haifa on the 22nd of April 48 to vacate the town. Um, the Jordanian Arab Legion in various villages around Jerusalem told the population to evacuate. Uh, and there were lots of village leaders in the coastal plain especially who told their women and children to leave, even early in the struggle, already in December 47. So, so there was a mixture of reasons for people leaving. No policy on the Israeli side, no consistent policy on the Arab side, but there was a general trend for departure, for flight, because people don't want to be caught up in a war zone. It's also likely that the Arabs didn't expect to remain refugees. They expected to leave their towns and villages, sometimes to a place nearby initially, and come back once the Arab armies won the war, or once the United Nations forced the Israelis to take them back. That's what they expected. Uh, they ended up being refugees. So where, where did the narrative that, um, the, let's say, the previous generation probably grew up with, where did it come from, the, essentially this narrative that the Arab armies called by radio and other means on the Palestinian populace to, to get up and flee en masse so that the approaching armies could push the Jews into the sea. Where did that come from? Uh, it's not that clear how that official Israeli narrative emerged. What is clear is that in Haifa, when the Haifa, the masses of Arabs left the town of Haifa, uh, it was done on the instruction of their local leaders and Israeli, the Israeli intelligence and military seemed to have assumed that the order had come from outside telling the local leaders to tell the population to leave. So, uh, uh, and if this happened in Haifa, perhaps there was a general um, a call by Arab leaders. But the fact is that Israeli intelligence documentation, which is now available, or was available since the 80s, basically, or 90s, um, it shows that there were no such instructions by Arab leaders, Palestinian or other Arab leaders, uh, to the general mass of population to leave. This didn't happen. There was no, there were no such orders. And the myth exists to this day, also taught in some Israeli schools, perhaps, that the Arab leaders told the Arabs to leave. There is no basis for that. In fact, in early May 1948, one finds orders by Arab leaders for the population to stay put, not to leave. That's very interesting. So it's, it's, it seems like there would have to be some sort of concerted effort then, whether intentional or otherwise, perhaps some, some sort of psychological reason, for, for how a narrative like that would come about if the evidence actually suggests the inverse? Well, people weren't necessarily uh, on the Israeli side. It wasn't that clear a bureaucracy that organized the bureaucracy. People didn't really know what's going on. It was in the middle of a war. Later, you can analyze the documentation and, and what people said and did and so on. But during at the time, they were busy fighting a war. Not too much attention was paid to why things are happening of this nature, which wasn't essential and also was seen favorably by the Israeli side. The Arabs are leaving. That's good. You know, no fifth column, uh, less Arabs the better, and so on. That was the attitude. Uh, but it wasn't uh, clearly thought out. It is true that at the end of November 1948, the end of, uh, sorry, at the end of June 1948, Israeli um, uh, intelligence, the Arab uh, department in Israeli intelligence, did send out a man 
who was the head of the department or the deputy head of the department to find out why the Arabs were leaving. They couldn't understand, which in itself, incidentally, is proof that there was no master plan or organized expulsion. So Israeli leaders asked the intelligence department to find out why the Arabs are leaving. And he wrote a 20-something page report about why the Arabs had left until the time he wrote the report, until uh, the June 1948. And he discovered that about 70% were leaving as a result of the war itself. Fear of war, fear of being uh, hurt during the war, etc. A small percentage were leaving because of expulsions by Israeli troops. A small percentage were leaving by, because of orders or instructions or advice by their own leaders. How did, so, and what's this person's name? The, the... Um, uh, Sasson, um, Moshe Sasson was his name. And do we know how he arrived at his conclusions? I mean, it's well, not... Well, I once talked to him. I eventually found out who wrote the report. It wasn't signed. It was written uh, Arab section, or Arab department, intelligence, uh, um, the intelligence service, as it was called. Um, he told me that basically it was during the truce in June that he was asked to do this. He looked at all the intelligence department's reports, their own documents for the, for the previous six months, what agents and, and case officers were reporting from different areas, different villages, different towns, why Arabs were leaving. There were lots of reports about this. And he went around the country also, and a GP told me, uh, looking at Arab villages, talking to some Arabs who had remained, what had happened, why they had left, and so on. And he wrote his report, which is very detailed. It's like a seven-page uh, a um, basic report which analyzes everything. He said he was also learning statistics at the time. This was a young guy and, and um, so he applied statistics to the, to the thing. But it also contains about 15, 18 pages of details about each village, what happened in particular villages in each area. So it's a very detailed report of what happened. Not everything in it is accurate because he didn't, he didn't have a big team working with him. He had to do it quickly. But, but most of it, is, it appears to be accurate if you correlate it to other intelligence material. And is this document still, it's been made available to the public? It, the, the document has an interesting history. A few copies were made, very few copies were made. Probably one went to the Prime Minister, one went to the head of the intelligence service, one went to the chief of staff. About 10 copies appear to have been made. One of the copies ended up in the Mapam archive in the uh, private papers of a particular man there who worked with Arabs. Mapam was a, was a large... Was a large left-wing, uh, a left-wing, but important at the time, a left-wing party which was in the government. And a lot of their people were officers in the army and in the intelligence service. And one of them took a copy of this thing home. So that's where I found it in the Mapam archive. I know a copy also exists in the IDF archive, of course. Uh, sometime after I used the report and wrote an article about it, not the book itself, but an article about the report two years before the book came out in 1986. I wrote an article in Middle Eastern Studies about this report, and then they immediately ordered its closure. And they told Mapam, they, they, in their, their archives, they're not allowed to show it to people. It was a secret document originally, and they didn't obviously appreciate it for whatever reason, or its declassification by Mapam uh, you know, workers in the, the archive. Does that remain the case today? I don't know. I haven't uh, asked for it. I have copies of it. I gave out. In fact, I gave copies to people who asked me. People at the time heard about it and said, show me, because they hadn't uh, found the report, hadn't encountered it. Um, but, but it might still be declassified, but it's, it's a case of the, 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 of the horses, uh, the barn door being closed after the horses leave. Yeah. Once you write the report about what's there and everything, there's no point in um, classifying, but that, that's how um, uh, governments sometimes operate. Right, okay, so, so that document seems to imply, at least through the eyes of this young intelligence officer, that there were a range of reasons why Arabs had been fleeing over the, over the course of the, of, of the war uh, in 1948. Um, Except for one major reason, which accounted for 70% of the departure up to June 1948, which was about midway in the creation of the refugee problem, 70% left as a result of the war itself, of the fighting, the, the fear of what's going to happen to their, them and their villages and so on. So, my, my understanding is that a lot of the contention lies in what exactly is it is entailed in that in in the in the phrase or the thought during the war in in the context of the war in the fog of the war so to speak. Some people would argue that there was um, absolute uh, intentionality, uh, if not from the upper echelons, and at least from specific units 
in the Haganah or, or other forces to actively expel Palestinians because there was some sort of at least unspoken plan or intent to rid you know, Jewish areas of as many Arab uh, citizens as possible, Arab would-be citizens as possible. Others say it was just chaos and people fled because they were frightened, much like you see in today's Syria, for instance. The truth is somewhere between these. That is, there was no plan, there was no systematic, systematic expulsion, there was no policy sent from the top down, expel the Arabs, that didn't happen. Um, on the other hand, people didn't just flee. There were places where officers expelled and so on. Uh, the, the truth, incidentally, is that no officer of the Israeli army was ever tried for expelling Arabs, and no officer was ever tried for not expelling Arabs, because it wasn't policy. But uh, from the top, it was understood, uh, from Ben-Gurion down, but not everybody was uh, complicit in this or party to this thinking, but ben -Gurion, from Ben-Gurion down, most of the people after April 48, and it's important to stress the time, five months into the beginning, into the war, the war began at the end of November 47. From the beginning of April onwards, I would say most of the officers and much of the civil command of the, the Jewish population in Palestine, later the state of Israel, was happy and interested in people leaving, but they understood they can't turn it into policy because Mapam would have objected, the left wing of the coalition government would have objected, it would have exploded in terms of internal politics, so they couldn't a, a dictate or couldn't arrive at a policy, a, an agreed policy. Why, why would the far left of, the, of Mapam have objected? Because they had always wanted peace with the Arabs, even a binational state with the Arabs. That was Mapam policy down to November 1947. They wanted a binational Jewish-Arab state, one state. Um, that was overturned, if you like, or undermined by the United Nations Partition Resolution. Well, if the world community says two states, we'll agree, agree now to two states, not one a unified binational state, but one Jewish state, one Arab state. So you're but, saying just but they nonetheless were soft on, on the Arabs. They were soft on policy on the Arabs. They even supported, officially at least, the return of the Arab refugees once the war ended, which didn't turn into Israeli government policy at the end of the war. Essentially, it was against return of refugees, but Mapam still in its party platform talked about the return of the refugees at some point. Uh, as a nod to the far left wing of the party? Uh, probably in some way, yes. But the, the far left of the party, as you call it, was half the party. It wasn't an extreme fringe group. The party was made up of two halves. One was Ahdut Avoda people who were Marxists, uh, but uh, strong nationalists, strong Zionist nationalists. And the other half of the party was Hashomer Atzeir, which was Marxist, but uh, not as strongly nationalist. And that half of the party, the Hashomer Atzeir party, was interested in a, a coexistence of some sort and the return of the refugees, for example, after the war. So the party didn't split on this, and they ended up agreeing that there should be a refugee return at the end of the war. But Ben-Gurion and his main, his party, which was the main coalition party, Mapai, eh, opposed the return, essentially. So they reached some sort of a formula in which, well, there could be a return as part or a partial return, not, not a full return of refugees, but a partial return of refugees on the basis or as part of a full peace settlement. Short of a peace settlement, there would be no return. That was the policy from 48 on, essentially. Has remained, incidentally, the policy of Israeli government since then. No return of ref no mass return of refugees. That's interesting. I, hadn't, I actually hadn't known about the about the Mapam stance and the and the, and the size of the, of the 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 size of the contingent essentially that it, that it wished well for they it. were very important. Mapam controlled a lot of the positions in the general staff. Alo Igal Alon, uh, uh, Galili, who was deputy defense minister, uh, Itzhak Sadeh, These were Mapam people. Um, uh, some of them were even uh, like the head of Givati, I can't remember his name, but the commander of the Givati Brigade was, uh, was uh, Hashomer Atzeir Mapam. Uh, so they were very important, in the, and they had two cabinet ministers who were also important. The, the agriculture minister and another guy, uh, Ben Toven uh, um, So they were, they were important, and, and Mapam had four cabinet ministers. That was the proportions, four and two. So they were very important in the coalition, and these six were the essence of the government. The government had 12 members, or 12 or 13 members. So they, they had a controlling interest in the government, really. These six, plus one or two uh, appendages.
Right. Okay. So, so that issue, the the corollary issue there of return and the policy by return is an important one. I'd like to get back to that. But before we go there, maybe we can. Maybe Let we me can... add one more sentence. Sure. Uh, you asked about the general, what the generals thought and the, the policy. It, it depended also on what different individual generals uh, uh, believed should happen. Generals and colonels, basically. And there were some generals who were interested in clearing the country of Arabs. Among them was Igal Alon from the Ahdut Avoda branch of Mapam. Igal Alon, commander of Southern Front, the man who took Lida and Ramleh, where one of the, big, the biggest expulsion of the war occurred of Arabs in July 48. Um, but there were other generals who were not interested in a mass expulsion, uh, like uh, Carmel, who commanded Northern Command, also incidentally from Mapam. He also, but he didn't support uh, expelling the Arabs, which is why, in some way, a large number of Arabs remained after 48 in the Galilee. He's one of the reasons. The fact that Moshe Carmel opposed expulsion, or seems to have opposed expulsion, or wasn't willing to go the whole hog. So you're saying the, the, the pattern of expulsions and today the, the remnant uh, Arab-Palestinian populations within the 48 borders is largely or at least partially an artifact of the particular views of individual generals yes, during the course of the war? because there was no policy. That's what I'm trying to say. Unlike what the Arabs believed, that there was a policy and systematic, it wasn't systematic, there was no policy, generals did what they liked, generals and colonels and majors, and nobody took them to task this way or that way. Because there was no policy. Before we go, we take a step back in time. What, what do you, just on that note, what do you say to the argument that nonetheless there was a momentum in the Zionist movement from the very beginning, as soon as people like Haram came and saw, you know, wait a minute, there's a whole other population here that the, these our so-called national aspirations are going to come into direct, into direct conflict with. Right from that get-go, there was, there was at least a tacit understanding that clearly something has to be done, quote-unquote, about the non-Jewish population. So, so what, do you, what do you say to the argument that okay. it was at least a, a tacit... Okay, look, Zionism from the beginning hoped to turn all of Palestine into a Jewish state. And Palestine was inhabited mostly by Arabs, not by Jews. The, the proportion of Jews gradually rose as uh, Jews uh, uh, arrived as immigrants. But when you Zionism, say Zionism, you were saying also the, the half of the Mapam party felt differently. Well, Mapam won't. was very small and only Mapam came into existence only in the 1920s, basically. Mm. Um, but the, the Zionists hoped that they would overcome the demographic disparity through mass Jewish immigration. That was the hope. Uh, and, and expelling Arabs, though there were some people in the Zionist movement like Israel, Zangville, Herzl even referred to it in his diary in some place, that expulsion or transfer would uh, ease the problem of Arab majority, Jewish minority, most Zionists thought in terms of getting a majority through mass Jewish immigration. Um, but there was an element also who supported transfer. On this issue of transfer versus expulsion, is, is one a euphemism no, it's, it's, for the it's, other? They're more or less synonymous. The word transfer is simply a euphemism for expelling people. Uh, they hoped, most Zionists like Ben-Gurion hoped it could be done um, in, in agreement. The Arabs would get compensation and leave uh, voluntarily and buy a piece of land somewhere else. But, but uh, it meant getting the Arabs out, uprooting Arabs, uh, or at least some of them. Uh, and this became a serious consideration in the 30s because the British, the Arabs revolted in Palestine. The um, Gentile countries in Europe were busy killing Jews or at least about to kill all their Jews. Anti-Semitism increased, which necessitated a safe haven in Palestine. And the British were caving into the Arabs as well by 37, 38. Um, uh, so, so there was a, and, and the Arab leadership in Palestine wanted to expel the Jews. They said that. This is what Khaj Amin Husseini said. So, so under these multiple pressures, um, uh, Zionist leaders like Ben Gurion and Weizmann began publicly, to, not publicly, but semi-publicly, if you like, to support transfer of Arabs. This was, of course, bolstered by the British, who uh, appointed a commission called the Peel Commission to investigate why the Arabs had rebelled in 1936 against the British. A, a mandate government and against the Zionist enterprise and the Peel Commission in 37 in its report said you, it, in order to have a solution we must divide the country into two states and in the Jewish state from the Jewish state we should transfer the Arab population so there will be stability if you leave, leave a val, vast Arab population in the Jewish state there will be a, a endless trouble by the Arab minority against the Jewish majority. So they supported, the Peel Commission supported transfer, and Ben-Gurion and Weizmann supported the Peel Commission recommendation on this. So you're saying the, Brit the British themselves 
recommended yes. transfer. No, uh, it wasn't initially the British government. The British sent a commission of inquiry, a royal commission, which is the highest sort of commission. And the commission reached the conclusion there is no escaping, separating the two peoples into two states. And from the Jewish state and from the Arab state, there should be a mutual transfer of population so that a homogeneous Jewish state and a homogeneous Arab state would emerge. Otherwise, there'll be no stability here. And the Zionists, of course, adopted this.